Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black Good evening again, we are joined here at uh, Left the Black on Location at Lehigh University. Shout out again to Dr. James Braxton Peterson for hosting us this evening. Um, we are joined now by Professor Jessica Marie Johnson, who is Assistant Professor of History at Michigan State University. She is also the 2015-2016 Mellon Postdoctoral Scholar in the Program of African American History at the Library Company of Philadelphia. How are you doing today, Jay? <laughs> As you are known to your friends. I'm good, I'm good, how are you? I'm good. Um, so in the midst of everything that's going on, Black Lives Matter and uh, a new presidential campaign with some crazy folks, um, <laughs> we're also, we have also marked the 10th anniversary of, of Hurricane Katrina yes. um, and, and I know NOLA is, is someplace close to your heart. Um, can you make any connections between um, the way that Hurricane Katrina forced us as a nation to look more honestly at race and class, and particularly for that younger generation, you know, that, you know, Hurricane Katrina is occurring just as, you know, folks are getting access to YouTube for the first time. Broadband is a thing you know, for the first time around Hurricane Katrina. So in many ways, you know, the kind of social media world that we know now, there's a generation of folks who only know black protests and struggle in that context because of that Hurricane Katrina moment. What kind of connections do you make to the generation of folks that get produced post Hurricane Katrina to Black Lives Matter? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's an interesting time to be talking about that because it is a 10-year anniversary. Um, there's been a lot of talk um, in the city and around the country, of course, uh, about commemorating it and what does that mean, what does that look like, um, and some tension there between um, streams of commemoration that are about resilience. Um, so the mayor has a whole commission that's called Katrina 10 that's resilient New Orleans. Um, and then there's a whole sort of insurgent other um, coalition of organizations, many of them grab grassroots organizations, people working with um, prisons, um, prison advocacy and things like that called Katrina Truce. Um, and so one of the things that, uh, there's a couple things. So one is that uh, that moment of Hurricane Katrina, um, because it was so viscerally optical, like because it was on screens, because, um, because the levels of black suffering were so accessible to everybody. Um, that uh, there were ways that you could not ignore the impact that this storm had, mm -hmm. but then you also couldn't ignore what was happening as it led up to the storm. Um, and if you were watching it as it occurred, I mean, and I remember watching it, because I wasn't there, I remember watching it from afar, being fascinated by how easy it was to render an entire population of the city invisible. And we're talking about not just black people across the board, we're talking about those who are impoverished, those who are poor, um, who are majority black in the city. We're also talking about the elderly, we're talking about the incarcerated, we're talking about sick and disabled people, we're talking about a lot of women and children. Um, so that in all the conversations about what, at the moment of Katrina, all the conversations about what, um, what evacuation would look like, mm -hmm. um, we'll just get to Houston, well, you have to have a car. <laughs> The idea that buses weren't necessarily mobilized um, with any kind of efficiency, that there weren't enough buses, that the Superdome should have been a place, well, if you just get there, you'll be fine. So that the idea that there's an expendable population, um, that idea that there's an invisible population that we still see, like we're literally seeing this population on screen get forgotten about. Um, yeah. We're seeing that population then become, be called refugees. Um, as they're forced to leave. In their own country. In their own country. <laughs> right. um, and then called refugees again throughout this commemoration process, as though they, there wasn't a conversation about what that word mean and how right. vile that was. Um, we're seeing, so all of that happened in that moment. Um, so the, it, it was almost like, like having double consciousness like actually be actualized. Like you have these conversations about, oh, you know, we have this plan and if you just follow the rules and if you go here, then you'll be safe, et cetera, et cetera. And you're literally seeing that fall apart before your eyes. Um, so that was in that moment. What's interesting about what comes out of that is that you're also seeing all these other threads that um, the commemoration sort of brought to light. So one you can think of as media. Mm -hmm. um, 
And it's funny because I'll, I'll teach. Uh, I know I'll teach a class called um, "From Katrina to Treme on the History of Black New Orleans." And a lot of my students actually don't remember this moment. So then there's a whole other thread of right now what we remember. <laughs> but you know what moment I'm going to talk about? Right, right. So um, Kanye's on screen, um, <laughs> and um, and he says um, George Bush doesn't care about uh, care about black people. It's during this you know, huge fundraiser, um, NBC producers. Um, and we find this out, you know, recently because they they disclose what their reactions were in this moment um, uh, during the commemorations this uh, this last this last month or so. And they're looking at it it's like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. This is how can this be happening? What is it going to do to fundraiser? This is amazing TV. Like this is literally their reaction, you know, as they're watching it happen. Switching to Chris Tucker, who, if you really watch, Chris Tucker is both excited right. about what's happening, right. and he's also terrified right, right. and has no idea what to do. Um, so you have, you know, so you have this, <laughs> this, um, this moment of media, this, moment, this, this, this intersection of where hip hop and Kanye and Chicago, um, <laughs> Chicago <laughs> rap sort of intersects with, you know, the ways that um, hip hop becomes a venue for truth telling, um, the ways that this becomes a moment that is broadcast everywhere. Um, that we all have access to, we all have different reactions to it. Even people in New Orleans are not all, in this moment at least, uh, in 2005, are not necessarily all saying, oh, we love that he did this. Some people are like, we actually really could have used the aid that maybe he pushed away. So there's this whole other kind of tension and complicated conversations that are happening around that. Um, but what is interesting about the way that we have NBC producers who are looking back at it now, or George Bush saying, oh, this was a terrible moment of my, my presidency, and then he goes back to Katrina, or and goes back to New Orleans during these Katrina commemorations, and he's talking to everybody, he's like, oh, this is great, I'm redeemed, um, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, like, you have these ways that media, we can think about how complicated media's relationship to these events is, yeah. you know? We can think about what it means to have Kanye up there in the moment of a fundraiser where really the state should have stepped in to right. add, bring those funds right. to right. its right. own citizens. Right. It shouldn't have been a telethon. It shouldn't have, you know, you right. shouldn't have needed a telethon. Um, you have the ways that um, celebrity is at work um, and what does that look like. Um, you have the ways that this becomes this iconic moment that creates t-shirts, like Kanye was right t-shirts emerged almost immediately after this happens. Um, and then you have conversations about media and the way that race is represented that I think Katrina is still sort of the shadow of. So like the fact that, um, uh, Anderson Cooper and whoever else can come into um, a moment like the hurricane and both do the work of publicizing it and drawing attention to the catastrophe and the atrocity and the failure of, of, um, of services um, and a failure of our commitment to the people who live in this country, people who reside in this country, citizens, undocumented, whoever, um, at the same time that that the that his ability to kind of then use that for his own celebrity across the reporters across media um the way that black death and suffering can become spectacle but also become profitable um we're seeing that i think a lot of residue of that now um the ways that um news sites can step in at particular moments the circulation of particular videos and natasha mckenna video just came out um, at this point, I think people, some of us are actually oversaturated with how much um, visualization of death it is because it doesn't seem to be doing what it's supposed to do, which is to tell people this is a problem, stop. Instead, media seems to be using it as a way to get clicks, to, um, to commercialize, to does, get does it feel like revenues, over, things like that. Does it feel like overstimulation? Um, there's a way in which we are now hyper aware of our trauma. Right. Our trauma was already always already known. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're surprised by any of this, but but we didn't have to visualize it. Right. We didn't have to consume it. Is there a danger at this moment that we're so inundated with our trauma that we might, in fact, become desensitized to it? Um, so when so when I think of that question, I think of um, Emmett Till. I'm a child of Chicago, Chicago born and raised. Um, and I think of the ways that Mamie Till mobili mobilized the black press yeah. um, and, and other press sort of hopped on to be present for the uncovered casket, um, Emmett Till's body on display to show this is what um, these men, these white men in Mississippi did to my child. Um, so I think it's a, I don't think there's an easy answer, I guess, is, is to that question. I think there's a history of protesters, families, black mothers who have lost children to this, um, black families who are losing people literally to 
um, to both state vi police and military violence, but also like prison system and incarceration, um, the way that they have mobilized the visual and media to work on their behalf. I also think there's, and there's an intersection here, but I also think there's, there's ways that mainstream media does some of that too, sometimes well-meaning and sometimes not. And I, the ways that they should be complicated, I think is work that we're still, still trying to still pull apart. What I do also, on top of that though, also know is that we are not as, in all of this, we're not as attentive to sort of the details and the needs of um, survivors and victims as we ought to be. So the idea that um, Eric Garner's widow is like, please stop passing around the video of his death. Like that's enough. We've, we didn't want that circulating in the first place. At the same time, Tamir Rice's mother is like, take that video and you show it everywhere because they yeah. killed my son right. and, they need to see it. and they need to see it. So I think, so how then do we balance that? You know, like how do we balance? Cause some of this is also about survivors need to, to witness, you know, and to testify. This is what they've done to my family and my child. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that is, is how do we then receive it? You know, how do we as the audience basically and, and relating to it in different ways. Some of us knowing that we walk around with bodies that can basically be, you know, destroyed at whim if we, you know, in this room, even if we wanted to. It, you know, it, it does raise interesting questions. Um, you know, families have different choices in how they want the death of their loved ones, you know, to circulate. You know, my colleague Carl Holloway talks a great deal about the ethics that we see in terms of, of corporate news and the choices that they make. Um, so none of us know what happened that day up in Virginia, really. We, we didn't see what happened that day up in Virginia with the two newscasters. Right. Um, but we see black death displayed on television all the time. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's, there's an appetite for it, really. And, and in, you know, to kind of extend the question you just raised, how do we find that balance between, you know, corporate America needing clicks, mm -hmm. needing good TV um, around our misery, and us needing at the same time to find a way to circulate that misery to get some sort of redemption, response, reparations, you know, in the broader sense of the term, justice. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's such a hard balance to strike. Um, so an example might be how people, because I, I don't think it was Natasha McKenna that was sort of the straw for a lot of people. I think it was Sandra Bland yeah. in that video. Yeah. Um, and how people responded to that for a whole host of reasons, particularly, um, I'm lying, I actually think it was a McKinney pool incident. Um, that it's the one that we sort of have skipped over because right. Rachel Dolezal sort of stepped in. Stepped in, right. But, this is, but I think also there's a way that that did a particular work. So I think the McKinney pool incident was so triggering, particularly for those who are working in the movement, many of whom are um, women or um, female women. presenting, right. um, people who are young people, Right. Um, who are literally being triggered by, triggered by this video, that when the Rachel thing popped up, it was an opportunity to laugh and to kiki and to take a break <laughs> in the face of something that was so visceral. And so then Sandra Bland also became, you know, that on top right. of and McKinney, young right. woman, right. just became back. too much to, you know, to sort of set aside. But there are ways that these two, I think, worked in conjunction um, for people to ask, um, how else can we present this? So if I think about how the Sandra Bland information is circulating now, it's actually for me less of the video and more images of her. Um, her talking about her activism, her talking about her politics, um, images of her family, uh, stories about her, uh, the Beatles shirt. You know, is the one that I see right. circulated a lot. Right. So People how, so yeah. yeah, so remembering, like thinking about ways that we mourn while also inserting some kind of humanity into the broader narrative, which is also of this video um, and adding context to that video. Um, so I, I think that those, that has been a strategy that's, that some people have taken up, but it's also, it's difficult. Um, I was just at Ferguson, um, Ferguson is the future at Princeton. And one of the things that, um, uh, Netta brought up, um, who was there, Netta DeRay, Brittany Packnitz, uh, some of the most visible Ferguson social media uh, protesters, um, not just on social media, but like protesters in general, they've been visible on social media. Um, and one of the things that um, Netta brought up was uh, the, the Natasha McKenna video coming at this point where we're, those particularly who are really, really close to everything that's been happening have been so exhausted with um, the circulation of, of images of black death and suffering. Um, we're, 
taking it upon herself to watch the video, but also to live tweet it. So how then do certain people find themselves in a position of like the heady and really horrible responsibility of, you know, well, you can't do it, so I will. Yeah. And I will do it in a way that sort of diffuses. it. So then social media becomes another kind of uh, mechanism and a venue um, for people to encounter the, what is happening, the truth of what is happening, but also to maybe be less traumatized. But then that's also a very tough role for, for people to play. It's like for that to be somebody's responsibility to, to report, to be a kind of lens. So. You are co-editing <laughs> a special issue of the journal, The Black Scholar, um, on <laughs> something so. that is termed Black Code Studies. Yes. Um, talk a little bit about black code studies. Sure, 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 sure. So um, <laughs> when we conceive of this special issue, Mark's being shy. <laughs> um, one of the things that um, one of the things that is really interesting about this moment are ways that uh, black people, the black diasporic people, are taking up technology yeah. um, for all kinds of means. Many for social justice, but often for play often for aesthetics, whatever it may be. Um, what Black Code Studies is, is a way to sort of think about a few things. One, how, are, how is this improvisation, as um, Mike was saying in the last segment, um, part of how people are using an, uh, technology? Yeah. Um, how um, are people getting around very structural um, uh, pressures that, uh, and problems of learning technology, of learning right. STEM, right. Of, of education, you know, like, so what are the kind of grassroots access technological to broadband, knowledge? Right. Exactly, <laughs> access, at the very least, access to broadband. Um, uh, building computers in their backyards, like things right. like that, things that we actually do all the time, right. um, but we just don't necessarily talk about. Um, so there's that, like the actual use of technology. What Black Coast Studies Tra does is Trayvon Martin that. at Space Camp. He was at Space Camp. Trayvon Martin at, I mean, it, and it's like, someone had this picture. Why did we ever see that <laughs> picture circulate for? Because yeah. that just changes everything. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So it's those kinds of moments where Black Coast Studies can bring that to light, but that's also something that Digital Black Studies does at Africa. Digital Africana does, that eBlack Studies has done. Um, I think what is interesting about Black Coast Studies is that it asks us also to look towards the future um, of this, of how we're how Black diasporic people are interacting with technology, but also drive back to the past. So, what are the ways that we've always innovated? How can we rethink technology beyond sort of nuts and bolts? How do we rethink codes um, and coding? Um, I do slavery, so I'm thinking of black codes, both 19th century black codes, but also race laws that emerged from the 18th century, 1685. Mm -hmm. the French Code Noir is like one of the first comprehensive slave codes for um, an empire's colonies, in this case, the French. Um, so what are the ways that those kinds of codes, the ways we think about um, codification of blackness or you know, color, uh, um, how does that in both relate to how people are using digital technology, either in media or actually in code and programming? Um, and how does that relate to how people are subverting it? You know, so the way that there's law and then there's actually on the ground. So it, it, uh, it asks us to bring these conversations that are happening all the time in digital black studies and have been happening. I'm thinking of um, Abdullah Kalima, you know, establishing e-black studies. Um, as a basically field of studies, HFRM, how that's been happening for a while, how do we draw it back to the homegrown genius that we've had for ever so long that has yeah. allowed us to get this far? Um, and this I sort of think of, um, I, think, I think back to New Orleans because I'm always there. Um, I think of the New Orleans Wild Seas, which is the brand, the chapter of the Octavia Butler Emergent Strategy Network that is based right. in New Orleans and how, they're, um, how they are uh, connecting what is um, the phrasing, one of the phrases like um, uh, ancient future, futuristically ancient. You know, how, do, how are these things connect? How is, is this part of a longer um, body of knowledge that people are mobilizing to rethink what technology even means, what we think when we're saying that. So yeah. that's DJ what I think Lene, when I bring Denise, it. Denise, Ex right, you know, exactly. wild seed production. Sorry. Exactly, exactly, exactly the same thing. Yep, yep. And tie it to social justice, if, you know, if at all possible, you know. We have been joined this evening by Professor Jessica Marie Johnson, Assistant Professor of History at Michigan State University, uh, a collaborator <laughs> and friend of Left of Black. Thank you for joining us. Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything.